them standing, some are waiting in line As if there was something that they thought they might find Taking some strength from the feelings that always were shared And in the background, the eyes that just stared Welcome to Season 2, Episode 4 of Song Chronicles, the first of a two-part interview with the legendary producer, Bob Ezrin. If ever there was a superstar producer, Peter Gabriel's solo debut, Lou Reed's Berlin, Pink Floyd's The Wall, and Alice Cooper's Love It to Death, Killer, and Billion Dollar Babies are among the classic rock albums Bob has produced. His remarkable career has also included working with acts ranging from Fish and Nine Inch Nails to opera superstar Andrea Bocelli and the classical duo Two Cellos. I first met Bob when I was 17. My label, Electra, had me meet with Bob about producing my first album. The meeting went well, but he later told Electra that he didn't want to ruin my life by throwing me into the music industry at 17. We ran into each other again years later in London. He said clearly his plan to save me hadn't worked. When I was attending Blackbird Academy in Nashville, little did I know his studio was directly across the street. So on occasion, I'd skip over and spend my lunch break with him. In this interview, we talk about his work with Alice Cooper, as well as making the wall. Yeah. Hi, Bob. How you doing? I'm good. Well, I appreciate you doing this. You're welcome. (laughs) One thing I wanted to ask you, everything that you've done has this theatrical thing woven into it, which I think helps bring things to another level, understanding audiences more and spectacle more and what people want. Although there's a huge diversity in the music that you've produced and written. Can you talk a little bit about where the theatrical interests came from? What you first saw growing up that made you start thinking in those terms? You know, in Jewish families in the 50s, 60s, it's probably still true today. But most of the parents were immigrants or children of immigrants. So they just come to North America. And with them, they brought a tradition of reverence for culture and learning and and to a certain extent, performance as well. So as kids, as soon as we were able to talk, we were singing with my parents. Both my parents were musicians, though my dad was a doctor, but he worked his way through medical school playing in in a big band in Canada. And my mom was a phenomenal pianist, concert grade pianist, who was too shy to play live. So I was the audience of one, you know, but, but so we were always singing and dancing in the living room. And uh, my mother's father was actually an amateur vaudevillian at night and a linotype operator by day. And he was a star in the Yiddish theater in Toronto. So he was a song and dance man. And I was the firstborn grandchild and a boy, you know, so, and I could sing, you know, so I was like, he hit the trifecta with me, right? And and he would just teach me all these songs and dances and things. And then one day he took me to the movies for the first time. And at the age of four, I believe, four or maybe five, I went to see The Greatest Show on Earth starring Charlton Heston. 
which was a movie about the circus. It was a movie about show business. It was, it was show business revering itself in every way possible. Everything was larger than life. And just, of course, I mean, it was like in Technicolor and Panavision or whatever it was at the time. And the sound, I mean, it was so big and everybody was singing and there was an orchestra in, and I got the virus, pardon the reference, at that moment. I was infected and I just knew even at that age, that was what I wanted to do. In that year, I think I was the ring bearer at my father's sister's wedding, my aunt Roz's wedding. And then when it was time for the reception, I was the master of ceremonies, which was kind of cute, you know, at five. And I said, step right up, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the greatest show on earth, which was what the ringmaster said at the uh, in the movie. Anyway, for me, it all became about performance and theater and, and making people happy with beautiful stuff. That was it, really. It was just do beautiful things. People get happy. They smile. They relax. They lose their problem. Forget your troubles. Come on, get happy, right? You know, so <laughs> yeah, that's why it was theater that informed my passion for what I do. I mean, I was passionate about music, apparently, because there was so much music in the house that I actually had a, a little record collection when I was like one and a half. And I used to be able to put the records on the little uh, record player <laughs> and I could sing along. So I knew all my favorite songs and everything. So, you know, you put it together and that's how you end up with a guy who, you know, makes records and does big shows. Yeah. And you do it so well. So what I wonder is it was Jack who got you in touch with, with Alice Cooper. You took on the band. Yeah. Because you started working with Vincent and the guys. What I'm getting at, were any of those elements present or were you the one who brought that concept? Oh, no, no. They were present. They were, they were present. Like me, that band grew up with television and movies and they lived in an isolated place in, in Phoenix, Arizona, which is, by the way, the most distant major city from any other major city in the U.S., so, you know, so it, it was kind of like an island and it was sort of, they grew up at a time when you could walk down the street and see cowboys and, and people with long hair were considered to be freaks, you know, um, but being all American teenagers, it was their job to rebel and their job to do the, um, the shocking, you know, they wanted mm -hmm. to shock their parents and shock their parents, friends and all that stuff. Anyway, they were, they were theatrical well before we ever met. So it was a match made in heaven, really. It was indeed a match made in heaven. It was because of their theatricality, actually, that I, you know, that I sort of, against my boss's orders, I committed the company to, to working with them. I mean, Jack Richardson, first of all, I owe Jack Richardson my life. I do. I owe him my career and this amazing life that I've had for all this time. Um, ironically, when my dad left the Bobby Jimby Orchestra as bass player, they gave the job to Jack Richardson. Neither of them knew each other, or nor did I know the connection between Jack and my dad until I started working for Jack and he had a big bass in his office. I said, you know, my dad used to play bass. Yeah, really where, you know. Anyway, so um, I went to work for Jack, who at the time was a recently departed McCann Erickson executive, ad executive, who used to do like uh, jingles and commercials and all that sort of stuff. And it was actually through his job there that he met and ended up mortgaging his house to sign the Guess Who, who went on to become the uh, biggest band in the world for a minute. And that minute was during the time Jack was producing them. They had this record called American Woman, which uh, was number one around the world. Mm -hmm. And they'd had a few other number ones before that, These Eyes. And, 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 and Jack was the producer of that stuff. But still, like, in his soul, he was, you know, a really straight guy, like a guy in a suit and a tie. And in walked Shep Gordon with Alice Cooper, Alice Cooper's first two albums under his arm. And he wants that guess who sound. He decided that, you know, what Alice Cooper really needed was a commercial record, which, by the way, was the right idea. So he goes in to see Jack and he shows him the pictures of, uh, he shows Jack the pictures of these five creatures of indeterminate sex, you know, and Alice is in a ballet tutu and they've got, they've got braided mutton chops and painted fingernails and <laughs> eye makeup and he doesn't know what the hell he's looking at. And he decided 
uh, I was in the meeting because I was basically his bum boy at the time. You know, I was like his assistant and following him around. And um, so I was at the meeting and I could just see his face change. You know, first uh, there's a manager, it's a band, it's Alice Cooper. He thinks she's a, a singer <laughs> and, uh, and he pulls out, he pulls out these two records of the pictures. They go on Jack's desk and I could just see behind you know, behind his eyes, you know, I could just, I could just see his brain going, Oh my God. You know, and uh, he, he was very polite. And as we are, Canadians are very polite people. And so he said, well, very interesting. Um, the kid will go see the band. And if the kid likes the band, then I'll go see the band. And then maybe we can talk about something and Shep was very happy. They shook hands. Shep left the office and Jack looks at me and goes, get rid of them. <laughs> like He just, he was so freaked out, but he wanted nothing to do with them. So I was sent to New York to Max's Kansas City, where they were playing at midnight to see the Alice Cooper group and tell them, thanks, but no thanks. That was my job. So <laughs> I went down to Max's Kansas City with a friend of mine, I was a CBC baby. You know, I was a, a child actor and did stuff on radio and things. And here was another guy like me that was doing CBC programs when he was a kid. We were about the same age and he was playing the lead in Hair, which at the time on Broadway was the cutting edge, like the edge of the cutting edge because there was full frontal nudity on stage, never been seen before. And so... After the show, I said, you know, you want to go with me? I got to go see this band, Max is Kansas City. And he said, sure, I'll come. So we asked people how to get to the club. And they said, well, you take the subway, get off at house and follow the laser beams. And we're like, yeah, sure. So we got off at house and we figured we'd ask somebody, but sure enough, you get out of the subway, there's laser beams going down the road. So we followed the laser beams down the street, turned left and right up the stairs into Max's Kansas City. And we walked in the door into a Hieronymus Bosch universe of spider eyes and spandex and, and you know, ghostly white faces with jet black hair and black lipstick. And it was another world altogether and both of us looked at each other this guy's you know he's supposed to be the cutting edge and he you could see like the look of panic in his <laughs> eyes you know anyway they led us to our table which was right up against the stage and the show proceeded to blow our minds like i just loved it i thought it was so cool that they had mixed um dadaesque theater with good you know heavy rock music and the audience they knew all the words and they they all looked like him and you know people were mimicking his actions and stuff and i just thought this is not you know this is like this is something powerful and so i go running up the stairs and instead of saying well thanks very much but you know we're kind of busy right now i burst into the dressing room and said we'll do it we'll do it i said I think you guys could make hit records. And they said, well, that's great because we think you guys can too or something cheeky like that, you know, because they were really punks. And uh, anyway, I walked out of there and, and realized that I was so fired because I had done exactly the opposite of what it was Jack wanted me to do. But anyway, I went, I flew back home the next morning and was pleading for my life in his office. And I just wouldn't stop talking. It's like, you know, literally, you don't understand. This wasn't rock and roll. There were no t-shirts. There were no jeans. It sets of lights and props and buff and buff. And the audience, they all had spider eyes and bad spandex. And I said, this isn't music. This is the beginning of a cultural movement. And Jack said, enough already. If you like it so damn much, you do it. And there you go. And that was the beginning of my career. I was six months into training. I, I, I didn't know my ass from my elbow. But, you know, I'd spent time in studios. So it wasn't like I was completely unfamiliar with the medium. And I'd been doing some jingles for the company while I was learning from Jack. So I was getting some chops, you know, mm -hmm. but I knew nothing. And and then Jack said, okay, we will do it. I'll send the kid again and he'll do pre-production with the group and then I'll, I'll do the album. So it became Waiting for Godot. I would go down there and we would do rehearsals and stuff, work on all the material and, uh, and they were loving it. They, they really loved the results that they were hearing right then and there. But they kept saying like, okay, so where's Jack? And I kept saying, he's coming, he's coming. Um, you know, he'll be here soon, you know, but let's, 
let's just uh, let's just run that one again, you know. <laughs> and um, so we we put the material together for four songs and uh, rearranged them and you know tightened them up and you know made them really powerful. And then we went to Chicago to record them, and that was when they they got to meet Jack. He he came to the studio with us. And then he went and sat on the couch and kicked me, literally kicked me in the ass and pushed me forward to the console where he would normally stand. And there I was. It was kind of like, you know, uh, without a net or Frankie for that matter, without, without any support. That's a fire sign theater reference. And if any of your listeners get that, then they get the secret prize. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, he just pushed me up front and that was it. I just had to do the job. I, you know, they gave me the talk back button and I had to go, okay, well, and, and also I'm relatively confident by nature. Some people say I'm pushy and other people say I'm completely obnoxious and they're welcome to their opinions. But, but I, you know, so I, I was really eager to show that I could do it, you know, and I, I wanted Jack to see me do it because I knew in my heart I could. And anytime I was about to make a massive error or something wasn't going right, Jack would jump in and save me. But basically we recorded my rearranged versions of uh, four songs, which included I'm 18 and is my body. Which is a great lyric, by the way. The lyric, the song about the body, I literally recently sent it to a bunch of students. And then what is there, like five writers on that song too, all men? And the lyric is so ahead of its time. Oh, well, really, the writers on the song were all uh, music writers, except for Alice, who was the lyricist. And they always have been. He is one of the most accomplished lyricists I've ever worked with. And I've had the honor and privilege of working with some really good ones, you know, over the years. And... Um, I mean, I think Bob Dylan said that he was the most underrated American lyricist, and I, I agree. Some of the stuff, let me find one for you. Okay, so this is, it's a song called No Man's Land off of the album Dada, which was his last uh, album for Warner Brothers, our last album for a while together. Um, and then, um, anyway, it was his last album for Warner Brothers. So the lyric is, I don't want to characterize it. I'll just read it to you. How about this? So it goes, I got a job in Atlanta in a mall playing Santa, not because of any talent, but because I was the only one the suit would fit. Everybody shopping, little sticky kids were hopping on my lap with their fingers in my beard. I guess they thought that I was really it. She sat down on my lap and she said to me, I'm 23 and I need someone. You look like someone who could play with me, stay with me, all day with me, because I'm in no man's land. Can't seem to find a real man. You know I'm looking for a steel man. She said, I'm in no man's land. I'm going to show you a real good time, and I'll gladly pay you double overtime. She was begging to be mine, but my job was on the line. Should I stay or should I go? I just didn't know. Hmm. So I left the kids, I left 50 kids standing in line. They were whining, they were crying, and their mothers, they were screaming in hysterics. And I swear I never heard such profanity. I dropped my suit on the floor. They were trying to block the door. They were calling her a whore. They were driven to nativital insanity. Nativital insanity. We drove away in her Mercedes Benz, dirty blonde split ends in the breeze. She said, I just I want to put you under my tree. You're just a little gift from me to me because I'm in no man's land and so on. It's genius. I mean, that's that's just amazing. And, and that's 1981, I want to say. No, it was later than that. It was because Sarah had already been born. It was 82 or 83 and um, not in one of his best periods, you know? So this is this is not even full on Alice Cooper. This is whatever he could pull together at the time. He just, he's a genius when it comes to language. That's amazing. And it works as a piece of prose, even outside of music. What's the name of that song? It's called No Man's Land. No Man's Land, and it's on the album Dada. The lyrics on Dada are off the charts. They really are, because it's a crazy, it was a crazy time for us. And uh, yeah, anyway, so... We were talking about is it my body, but but he's always had that kind of sense of irony and humor and the ability to really understand 
the condition and to portray it, you know, not just from the point of view of a white male privileged, you know, whatever. I mean, he, he sees through everybody's eyes and it's really cool. So good. And like Lou Reed also, who had that social commentary ability to see through. Yep. Like, you know, when I think back on the stuff that I've been, I've been allowed to do, I'm so humbled and people use this term all the time, but it's true. Like I was just writing something yesterday because my granddaughter enrolled me in this program called StoryWorth, where they send you a question every week, you answer it, and then they put it together in a book at the end of the year. And then they give it to, you know, whoever ordered it. So I actually paid for us to have books for all the kids. And and she is she's the oldest of the grandchildren. And she's almost like my daughter because I was 17 when her father was born. And then when when she made me a grandfather, I was still very young. So she sent me this. And I was writing yesterday. The question was, who inspires you? And I started to make a list and it was just, I knew it was like, this is just going to be way too long, but I wanted to get, you know, enough names in there so that they understood your mom's one of them. And um, definitely. And, you know, I, I always think it's your mom, but it is your mom and dad who did this stuff together. And um, yeah, so I was writing this out and just looking at the list of names of people that I've been beyond fortunate enough, like just completely blessed to be able to have worked with. And it is humbling. It's humbling because, because you realize when you look at these people who are touched in this way, who, are, who have tapped into the jet stream of spiritual development and uh, sort of a universal consciousness that's above and beyond what most of us can manage to reach, you realize that they're on another plane. There's no, there's no two ways about it. And not completely. They're only on another plane in insofar as what they do. They're regular folks like you and me. If Lou and I were having dinner at any given time, he'd just be complaining about his backache or, you know, he'd tell me about the new glasses he just bought, you know, but in his craft, in his art, he's like unequaled. And I can say the same thing with, with Alice. And then, and then of course, you know, Roger Waters, of, you know, talk about one of the greatest lyricists of all time. And, you know, that's a special talent. I can't, I, I'm a writer. I can write, but these people, there's something it's beyond writing. This is just channeling the, the truth of the human condition, right. And putting it into such a beautiful form making it so delicious, making it feel so good in your ears and in your mouth when you sing along, you know? Like, that's just, I'm in awe of them. That's amazing. And I've always said that about songs, that they have to taste good. Sometimes people write and they don't realize the words need to be sung. And that's so right. The first person I've heard say that. And the thing is, Bob, they needed someone like you to contain it because there's no point walking around having that without understanding. And, and I think part of the struggle with having those traits of the people you're describing is that a lot of times you're walking through a world where people are deaf and they can't hear what you're saying or blind and they can't see what you're showing. And, and you, you do, and you're able to bring it to life. And so you do this amazing service in your ability to Calm the waters. Well, you know where you know where this comes from. And by the way, thank you for characterizing me. That's that's a little bit, you know, it's romanticizing me on a certain level. You know, I'm still a pushy guy, and uh, and I do have a very definite plan because that's my job. Mm -hmm. Is my job is to deliver something at the end of all of this that excites people and and makes them want to have it and and makes them feel good and maybe even on some level if at all possible elevates the world i mean that to me i'll tell you a funny story so by you know i i was helping to support a young pianist in toronto who was my sister's boyfriend both of them were concert pianists mm -hmm. and uh, i shouldn't say were both of them are concert pianists and this is when they were teenagers mm -hmm. His name is Chai Chow, and he's since become a world-renowned uh, Mozart proponent and all that sort of stuff. But at the time, he showed amazing promise. And I started to work with him a little bit on his left-hand and right-hand relationship. Because from my point of view, the one thing that, that uh, always held classical 
uh, performers back was that they didn't understand that the left is I'm talking about pianists now that they didn't understand that the left hand was their rhythm section and that the right hand was the lead guitar or lead vocal, whatever. So that you anchor the left, you have to anchor the left and everything else will be fine. Then you can move around on top of it, but if it don't swing, it don't mean if, if it ain't got that swing, it don't mean a thing. Right. So, so we worked on that and then he went and he won the uh, Sydney piano competition, which is a huge honor. And, and of Canada as a country, we were all very proud of him. There was press, there was all that stuff. And my parents, of course, especially, you know, my mom, who was, you know, classical pianist too, they were just over the moon that this was possible. And my dad said, congratulations. Um, you've now made up for having lowered the cultural level of the universe with Alice Cooper. <laughs> it was a joke, but yeah, that's funny. But anyway, I, I, I get it. I'll tell you where this comes from. It comes from being the eldest of eight. That's where it comes from. And from when my parents got older and less uh, capable of handling themselves and their own affairs and everything, I just sort of took over. So I became like the head person of the family. That's my job. I sit at the head of the table only in terms of responsibility, not in terms of how I see myself. So I've always been responsible for somebody else, always, my whole life. I mean, from the time my brothers were born when I was two and a half years old, by the time I was five, I was given uh, $5 and sent to take them to the movies on weekends. Like seriously, my brothers, my two and a half year old brothers and I would walk down the street over to Bathurst Street and we'd go to the Saturday afternoon uh, double feature to get us out of my parents' hair, basically. That's a lot for a five-year-old. Yeah, by the time I was seven or eight, I was taking them on the streetcar. But of course, by the time I was eight, I was doing television. I was basically the rent-a-son for everybody's show. You know, on, on the Wayne and Schuster show, I was Johnny Wayne's son. On the Jack Duffy show, I was Jack Duffy's son. I was, you know, basically the go-to kid. So there was always responsibility. And also there was always the element of, you know, deliver the goods. You know, it's a performance. You got to do it. You got to say your lines, got to look in the right place. You got to walk to your mark. You got to do that stuff. So that's kind of baked into me. Yeah. And a lot of respect. I mean, I was at the village when you were working with the Hollywood vampires. I've been in so many situations with you that are, you know, to an onlooker, star studded situations. And when you're in the room, the playing field gets to the same level where no matter how much ego somebody has, as soon as Bob speaks, they listen. There's respect. Yeah, you, you've, you've earned the real estate of taking care of things and being reliable. Yeah. You must get asked all the time about Pink Floyd and The Wall and Alice and Kiss and, and Lou, Lou Reed. But you've worked with a wide variety, Andrea Botticelli. And um, I see you did a Flo and Eddie record too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did. <laughs> I did. I loved that. That was so much fun to do. Um, yeah, because as I say to lots of people who are thinking about doing this kind of stuff, you know, like, well, what is that? How does that relate to that? And the truth is there's really only one music, right? You know, it's like, there are notes. And, and if we're talking about in song craft, you know, there are notes and then there are words that ride on those notes. And, and when it's done well, it's great. And it doesn't matter what genre it is. And when it's not done well, you know, maybe then sometimes the genre becomes like inhibiting because it demands that you do things in a certain way and it, and it doesn't serve the, the actual song. But most of the time, it's just about it's just about a glorious marriage of, of melody and language to tell a story and touch a soul, right? That's it. That's all there is to it. And so, you know, if you're really great at what you do, whatever the genre is, I love you. I just love you. I'm in awe of it. You know, I'm just, you know, I get to see these people perform and I also get to see them prepare for performance, which is something that most people don't get to see, right? They don't really know what goes into the learning of something, the, the practicing of something, how hard it is, how much attention there is, there, there has to be to detail, how in 98% of the cases, it, there's no accident, right? It's, this is entirely intentional. In, in a few cases, there are some people who are just, you know, they're just like from another planet. They get dropped on earth. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know why, but it's just all, you know, unbelievable. 
But most people, you know, are, they have an intention. They want to do this. They want to tell this story. They want to perform this song and they have to work to get there. And the work is, it's tough. It takes a lot. So I watch them with great respect and, and at the same time, also a little bit of, um, you have to be understanding of what people go through in order to make these things happen, of how hard it is to put your, put yourself on the line. You're not just saying words or singing notes. You've called up a feeling from somewhere, most of the time from your own soul, from your own history, your own experience, your family, your friends, or, your, or what you're going through at the time. And then you put it into this form and then you tell everybody. Then you have to go out there and do it for everybody else. Night after night after night, you have to call up those feelings again. Mm -hmm. You have to go through that stuff again. Sometimes it's, you know, it's treacle and, and okay, that's all right. And that's not too terribly painful, but every time it's confessional and sometimes when it is yearning, that's tough. It's tough to be in that place over and over and over again. And when people are, are rehearsing that sort of stuff, you know, just, you know, going over it and over it and over it, it takes its toll. Mm -hmm. So when you say, you know, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm understanding and all that sort of stuff. I, I'm, I think I'm more than anything, I'm reverential, right? I, I revere the, I revere the art and, and I love people. I've always loved people. And, and I love anybody who puts their heart and soul into something and really invest themselves in it when you can see that. So, you know, like I, I love some hockey players and football players and, and, and basketball players, but most of all, uh, you know, my orientation is towards the arts. So there you go. Who else was on your list? Oh my goodness. <laughs> it's, it's a huge list. I mean. A few, can you give us? A... Okay, so here's the, a partial list, okay. right? Including your mom, right? I also have Greta Thunberg and the entire Fridays for Future movement. I love them. I love all of those kids. I love their sense of determination. I've got Beethoven, Beyonce, and the Beatles, you know, as an example. I've... <laughs> the, three, the new three Bs, <laughs> Beethoven, Beyonce, and the Beatles, you know, but, uh, you know, Martin Luther King and, and, and Barney Frank and, and Bella Fleck and Caravaggio and, and Bobby Orr and Tom Stoppard and, and all the members of Monty Python and Bill Gates and, and so on and so on. That's yeah, these are people that inspire me with with what they've done and uh, what they stood for and those who are still alive, what they're still doing. I, I know that for you, you said the last time we spoke that you're very much concerned about being of service and giving back and, you know, helping is a big part of your focus right now. I, I want to ask you about the Nimbus School and how that started and, and the things that you just spoke about, the Nimbus School of Recording Arts. Um, what you just spoke about, about all the detail that has to go into performance and the preparation, are those some of the things that are taught in the school or is it more about recording? The, the school is primarily about um the about the media you know about about making recordings and um and doing video and that sort of stuff it's it's more tech technically oriented but there as a component of it there is also you know having to understand the the stuff that you're that you're recording and the stuff that you you know that you're uh trying to capture and uh so everybody has to make music they are all pretty much musicians, everyone that, that um, enters the school. How it started was, was um, Garth Richardson, who is Jack's son. Um, I was Jack's protege, Garth's my protege, and, uh, and, and, um, and my kid brother, basically. And, um, you, you know, I went to see his studio out west, and, and he had just fired an assistant and was just saying, just lamenting, just saying, like, I can't find anybody to work as an assistant on this stuff because these kids coming out of these schools, they don't know their, 
you know, they don't know whether to wind their elbow or scratch their watch. They have no clue what to do, nor do they know what there's, how they're supposed to act in the studio. And I said, funny, you should mention that, you know, I just had the same thing. And, and, uh, and then we, I guess we just concluded, you know, that we were taught by Jack. I was taught by Jack. Uh, all of these different things that um, go into being a, a, a positive and productive presence in the studio. And, and it has to do with more than just, you know, being proficient with a, a computer or a console or miking. It has to do with, with how you are who you are as much as with what you do. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we decided that we would, you know, we're going to start our own school and start uh, focusing on building better people for our industry, basically, by um, not just teaching the, the craft part, which is, of course, hugely important, but also uh, teaching the soft skills and teaching the human part. And, you know, part of my mantra is it's far more important how you are than what you know. And, uh, and by that, I mean, if you're, and I, I, you know, I say this to the students, look, if you're an asshole, I don't care if you're the smartest guy in the world, I'm not working with you. Yeah. Right. You can be the best engineer ever created, but if you, if you act like an idiot or you aren't sensitive or you, uh, you know, or you're a, a negative presence in the room, I don't want you there. I'd much rather have someone who adds to the spirit and, and complements what's going on and is respectful and understands the complexity of the situation and, and treats it with the, the appropriate reverence. That's the person I want to work with. And I'm happy to teach them anything they don't know. And I'm also even happier to learn from them what I don't know. That's my, that's my favorite thing in the world is to be in a room. To, I love to be the dumbest guy in the room. I love it because it's fascinating. It's just like the, you know, the, the process and the art is so fascinating to me. Yeah, you get to, you Still, get to be a kid again and not have to be the daddy in the room and be responsible for everyone. They're teaching you something. Well, yeah, I, I, when you say kid again, talk to Jan, you know, my wife says that I'm, I'm, you know, going on 15. I'm basically a perpetual teenager. And it's not just her who says it. So, you know, uh, David Gilmore's wife, his first wife sent me a book that that was entitled Puer Eternus, which which means the eternal boy, right? <laughs> and uh uh, I guess that's another thing, you know, it's just, you have to keep your, you really do need to keep the passion and the wonder of youth about you for as long as you can. Cause the minute you start getting to where you think, you know, shit or where you think you're grown up and nothing astounds you anymore, you're missing out on, on most of what's valuable in life. And some people get to that place when they're 31, <laughs> you know, so it's a good reminder it it's yeah well it's one of the good things about the music about music as i was going to say the music business no the music business sucks all around but it's one of the wonderful things about making music and performing and all that sort of stuff is that you you can be a you, you're you're a child forever mm -hmm. you're a kid you just have this childlike sense of wonder and excitement and passion and energy and you can't wait to get out there yeah yeah well, you brought up David Gilmore, and I, I have a question for you. I mean, there, there's lots of questions, but I remember going to see a Pink Floyd show. I can't remember if I saw it in the UK or here, but there was a moment in time where I saw them play, and David's sound, you know, sitting pretty close on the floor, and it, it seemed like overnight, like within a year or two, his sound just got amazing, and and. I, I don't know if there was something that happened with the live crew at some point. And I don't know if it's something that was just where I was sitting. The show was really organized. Things felt like they got reeled in and refined in this period of time. It must have been around the time of the wall. You know, I can't identify with that because I never saw them when they didn't sound like perfect, like unbelievable. Hmm. 
they were, they always sounded amazing to me. Some of these, the, you know, the trash cans that are, or that were the arenas then, I think modern arenas are much, much better, but um, the older arenas are just metal, you know, they're metal structures with reflective walls are horrible from a sound point of view. That's one of the things that, that actually, that excited me about working with Pink Floyd was that they were such perfectionists and they, and also that technically they were really groundbreaking and adept. And uh, when it came time to work together on the wall, it was to me, the greatest excitement of the very beginning of that relationship was that I came to England and realized that there were a couple of things that I had recently learned that they would really love so that I was able to come into the room and bring some technology to them and some ideas to them that, that, that they, they hadn't employed before. And that made it really exciting for them too. It wasn't just somebody coming in to say, do this, do that, but it was like, wow, what if, you know, we could try this. And, um, do you remember what it is? So we, Oh yeah, of course. I mean, we, we employed, um, transformerless and frictionless tape recording at a time when that just really didn't exist in the wide world. It was one particular kind of tape machine made by one guy in LA, very temperamental, very difficult to deal with, but the sound was off the charts. And, um, and also doing multiple machine recording. And for me, one of the best decisions made on the wall before we even started was uh, I had been through an experience where um, something had happened to one of my masters and I had to go back to an old um, safety uh, and replace it. When I put the old safety up, the old safety sounded way better. And what I realized the difference was, was that the more you played tape, the more you were polishing the surface and you were scraping off little pieces of iron oxide, which is where the, you know, where the magnetic energy was being stored that turned back into music. And you were actually making things sound worse by playing the tape over and over again. So uh, and also, I, I also knew from experience that 16 track sounded way better than 24 track for me. So, um, so when I came to them, I just said, look, let's do our basic tracks on 16. And then let's make a copy and use a time code that they use in movies. We'll use a time code that they use in film. This was before SMPTE. This was before anybody was doing this kind of thing in terms of, of audio recording. But we use it. We found this thing called the Mini Mag, which was really primitive, but it it worked. And uh, so we striped. We did this on the 16 track. We did the drums, the bass, and a guide guitar. That's basically what we had, or a guide guitar and vocal. And on track 16, we put a stripe from the Mini Mag. Uh, and we did that at the same time to a 24 track on another machine right next to us. Then we took and, and we copied the 16 track to the 24, but we bounced down the track. So we, we had eight or 10 tracks of drums. I don't remember exactly. Um, and I bounced it down to like, uh, you know, uh, bass drum, snare drums. That was it. And then, and then a bass and the guide track. So now I had like, 19 more tracks to play with. And, and these 19 tracks was what we used for overdubs. But as we got deeper and deeper in, I kept uh, copying and switching until we got to the mix. And at the time of mix, then we combined um, multiple machines into one 24 track that we had. And for the first time, we dusted off the 16 tracks. We had not played them, not even once since they were first recorded. That's so brilliant. Oh, my God. The, the sound, like when those things came up, because we had gotten used to what we were hearing. You know, we were hearing copies of copies of copies, and we were just adding stuff to it. And when, when we, first of all, when the, the machines synced successfully, there was a sigh, a collective sigh of relief in the room. I knew it was going to work, but everybody else was scared shitless. And in fact, on Comfortably Numb, we'd run out of tracks. We, we basically ran out of tracks. There was one more thing that I needed to add on the 24 track. And uh, so I said, uh, well, let's just 
erase the drums and put it over there, knowing that I had the 16 track, right? And, but that same look that's on your face of, of extreme panic right now was what everybody in the room was looking like, no, you know, and I said, no, it's going to be okay. You know, trust me, trust me, I'm a doctor. That's my joke, right? I say, trust me, I'm a doctor, but I'm not really one, but I play one on TV. <laughs> um, so we erased the drums and put this last thing on the 24 track. And now everybody was like petrified. And then we pulled out the 16 and we synced it up with the mini mag, which didn't work first time, uh, but then we tweaked a little bit and then it did. And when it did, the sound just knocked us back in our chairs. The sound of the drums and the bass on that record. And that's entirely because we didn't polish the tape. Mm. And also because we recorded them in 16 track and we gave them lots of space and air. And, and anyway, so I was excited about doing that, right? I was really excited that I could bring that to Pink Floyd who were, you know, they were my heroes on so many levels. And that and other things, you know, um, I really, I loved that experience. I did, I loved making that record. And, and, and that was one of the more difficult ones from a personality point of view, because there was already stuff going on between the members of the band and, um, Roger's wife was, you know, basically agitating in the background to a little bit, you know, telling him how, you know, it was all him and, and, you know, the stuff that happens some, sometimes when you have groups of people mm -hmm. working together. And there was some, you know, on, on the part of some of the other guys, you know, they wanted more of a voice, they weren't getting enough of a voice. And then all of a sudden, here's this new guy, like, what's he doing here? You know, why aren't we producing, you know, so there was a lot to manage. But in the end, everybody was wonderful, you know, and, and I mean, we're all human beings. We all had, you know, and God knows I was going through my own crap at the time. My marriage had broken down and, and, uh, and here I was like thousands of miles away from home and away from my kids. And, you know, it was, it was tough. Mm. And I was doing drugs at the time, which was not useful. But in spite of all that, I was also still pretty good at what I did and, the result, and, and they are just like geniuses, right? I mean, you're talking about Dave Gilmore, when David picks up a guitar, I always said, you know, you could give the guy a ukulele and a plug a ukulele into a pig nose and he'd make it sound like, you know, like the voice of God, right? Yeah. Just another worldly sound. And, and the other guys, I mean, you know, a style of drumming that Nick perfected that, you know, was just, it was, it was, uniquely him it was just him nobody else on earth was playing quite like that and and that was so much a part of the sound and feel of floyd at the time he was very underrated as a drummer and 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 we we learned how essentially he was on momentary lapse of reason when he wasn't there for all of it um you know it just changed everything that you know you needed you needed uh, Nick Mason to have Pink Floyd and you needed Rick Wright that voice that magnificent voice and and the way that he you know he brought us sensibility to the organ the Hammond organ that was unique and that the minute you heard that organ you knew you were listening to a Pink Floyd record didn't matter if you heard it you know if you just heard like two bars and you heard that organ you're like okay yeah I know who it is in the same way when you heard Roger's voice or David's voice or David's guitar. So what a what an amazing group of people with massive talent and and huge uh, personalities that were that imbued and informed their music. I I, I couldn't have been happier. Well, okay, well that was such a spectacular answer. You're making it too easy for me. Like you're good at the uh, the interview gig. <laughs> You're doing my job for me. You know, I wanted to ask you about, I'm, I'm just jumping forward in time because I remember a conversation with you. I was in my backyard. I remember standing back there talking to you on the phone and asking about production and 
you know, should I get more into production? And, and you said, oh, it's over. It's just over. It's all about live now. Like records aren't selling. Nobody has enough mm -hmm. money really to pay for records at the level that you needed to make records. And that it was all about the income that those bands could make playing live. Of course, now live... Now live's over and we're, but yes, and we're back to making records. Well, let's, let's be clear about what I said when I meant it was over. Yeah. You were asking me about how to augment your income. Mm -hmm. So there's a very specific, right? It was a very specific question. You wanted to know if you, if, if production was a good uh, job mm -hmm. at the time. And this was when, um, you know, MP3s and, and streaming and all the other digital formats that were easily traded and so on had basically dim diminished the potential sales of all, almost yeah. all records, except for the three or four massive hits that we would have at any one given time that were pop. Mm -hmm. and, and it's hard to predict those, and it's very hard to count on making a living out of it. And so my counsel to you was... Um, based on, you know, my concern that, you know, you needed to make money and that was probably not going to be the best place to start. There were producers that were making a lot of money at the, at that time and are still making a lot of money because they are the ones who make those three or four hits that are happening all the time. But where there used to be a bunch of producers in the middle making money, that sort of dried up for a second. Or the, because the other the other part of it let's let's be clear producers would generally make um a certain amount in front that would be considered an advance against their portion of the sale of the thing that they had just created mm -hmm. they weren't in for live they weren't in for merchandise they weren't getting a part of anything else but they were getting a piece of the record called the royalty and so if they had a record that sold you know, a few hundred thousand copies and they had some royalties coming from that, they could make a decent living. The advances were not huge, but they were okay to sustain one while you were waiting for the royalty checks. And then somehow in that kind of leapfrog of, of advance to royalty check to advance to royalty check, you could make enough of a living to, to get through the year for a lot of people. So, but that had disappeared when you asked me. Mm -hmm. By that time, producers were working for their advances, but they were getting no royalties because the records were not selling enough to recoup the cost of making the record, which is mostly required before anybody gets paid, especially the producer. So I just didn't think it was a very good time. Who could foresee this? Now we're in a position here where records are the only way that, that uh, not just records, but performance in a digital setting or in a studio or, or at home or something like that, and then played out to the world through streaming. That's about the only way you can get to people now. Radio, yeah, sure, and certain formats, but mostly it's a streaming world. And, and those don't pay the kind of money that working producers were used to earning from the sales of physical product. Um, on the other hand, now people are starting to discover new and exciting ways of engaging audiences and, and offering the audiences opportunities to see things and get in on things and experience things that they, that they're, that they love, they're hungry for, and they're willing to pay for. And so there's a new world and I kind of love it. I, I think it's actually great because it has in a certain way democratized things uh, again, once again, um, but I also know that it is extremely challenging for anybody that's about to get started to find a way where, where uh, an income is guaranteed. So like, if you're going to get started, you have to be prepared in exactly the same way I was to be in a, in a place where you just, you just got to work really hard and hope that your stuff is going to be successful. And then you're going to actually make some money. I was working for peanuts for, for Jack when I was his assistant, of course. I mean, that's, that's the way it goes. I, I was hardly able to pay for my family and, I, and, and my wife was working at the same time for us to stay alive. But to my, you know, insanely good fortune, 
and I'll never forget this. I will never for a moment take for granted that I got what I got because, because I'm so good. I was so lucky that Alice Cooper walked into that office that day and frightened Jack Richardson, right? That the first record that I got to produce, uh, you know, international record, not, not just a Canadian thing that I had, that I had done, but the first major album that I got to produce was Love It to Death by Alice Cooper, which did very well. And, you know, Jack gave me a raise. So, then for the next few years, while I was producing these Alice Cooper things, I was a salaried producer to, uh, to Nimbus. Then I got a raise. And then later on, as things were really starting to take off, you know, when they realized that I was kind of a golden goose, <laughs> um, they, they also um, started paying me bonuses on the royalty money that would come in yeah. on these things. So, and then later on, I became a partner. And then, you know, then I was a royalty guy. But at the very beginning, I was I was working for peanuts. I was living in in you know in a rental place and and doing my best you know to try and stay alive. And uh, and I took a a risk. Listen, when I say it like that. It's almost like I had any choice. I had no choice. You know, I, I you know it wasn't like there was anything else I could do or wanted to do or really you know like I had the passion for I had to do this yeah. I just had to I was compelled to do it. So when I say I took a risk, it's not like I made a conscious decision that I'm going to accept less now because I think I'll get more later. This was all about I just have to do this stuff. Uh, yeah, I mean it's interesting you use the word risk because that was a word I was going to bring up. Because some of the records that you made were really risky, you, you know, for example, with Kiss and with Lou Reed. I mean, you, you took artistic directions or, you know, with the band that were risky at the time. And I mean, even the term rock and roll doesn't sound that potent anymore because we've been living with it for so long. It's It's become a mainstream word. But the theater of things... It's important to stay in risk and to keep challenging and keep pushing things out of a comfort zone in order to make something that by the time it comes out is going to strike people as somewhat risky and new and not something they've heard already. Yet there's a certain mindset and courage of taking that direction because it could fall flat on its face as as with Destroyer at first, you know, with Kiss. Yeah, it did. Yeah. <laughs> it sure did. And then later, you know, later turning around and people going, oh, wow, this is an amazing record. This is our favorite record. Mm -hmm. But at the time, it was risky. And so was Berlin. Well, Berlin was definitely, I mean, yeah, I guess you're right. On a certain level, yeah, a lot of this stuff was risky. I mean, in a way, even The Wall was risky. The Wall was a, a double album, 90-minute concept record and not a loose concept, like a very, very direct concept. Mm -hmm. Songs ran together, the story was coherent, and yeah, I don't know, maybe I'm just drawn to that sort of stuff. You've been listening to episode four of Song Chronicles, season two. I want to thank my guest, the renowned producer, Bob Ezrin, for this fascinating discussion on his amazing career. And there's more to come from Bob in episode five. On Song Chronicles, you'll hear the behind the scenes stories told by music makers and music industry insiders themselves. You can check out the dozen episodes from our first season, which includes interviews with Gloria Estefan, Al Schmidt, Peter Cakes, Kathy Ballantyne, J.D. Souther, Desmond Child, and more. If you're enjoying the podcast, please take the time to leave a review on Apple, YouTube, Spotify, Podbean, or wherever you stream. I'm your host and producer, Louise Goffin. <laughs>